الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله حمد الشاكرين والصلاة والسلام على سيد المرسلين سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه يجمعين اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد طب القلوب ودوائها ونور الأبصار وضيائها وعافية الأبدان وشفائها وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد كلما ذكرك الذاكرون وغفل عن ذكرك الغافلون Today's subject relates to what people term as being modern issues. In reality, those things which are termed as being modern issues are regurgitated old arguments, ancient arguments, repackaged in modern ideology and modern jargon. Because all the Anbiya alayhimu salatu was salam, the previous, previous prophets alayhimu salam tackled and defeated all the old and ancient deviances that crept in amongst humanity. From the time of Sayyiduna Nuh salam, through the time of Sayyiduna Ibrahim, Sayyiduna Lut salam, and all the various prophets salam, up to the prophet Sayyiduna Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, all the various ideologies man-made, ideologies that were countered by the Anbiya alayhi salam, who were recipients of Al-Wahi, divine revelation, are mentioned in Al-Quran al kareem to the point that some of the ulama, like the author of uh, a book on At-Tashabbuh, Resemblance, one of the ulama of Gaza, was the title Al-Ghazi, a uh, classical alim, he has a book on Tashabbuh, Resemblance. A book, voluminous, 12 volumes, where he mentions resemblance, the good types of resemblance, like human beings when we resemble angels, how angels write and read, human beings re write and read. Animals do not read and write. But human beings, they have ange angelic characteristics. So we resemble creatures like angels, but we can also have the ability to resemble despicable types of human beings or the makhluk, which is dis, uh, the creation, which is disobedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The current wave of ideological misguidance that we observe today may have its roots in many things, and that is one of the subjects which we will we'll be tackling in the spider's web. This lecture in Accrington toward the end of the month, the spider's web. What is the spider's web that has been woven across the world? And as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in Surah Al-Anka'bout, that the spider's web is flimsy. S structurally, the web may look beautiful. And the web can function because the web catches flies for the spider to consume. But it, nevertheless, the structure is flimsy. The ideological structure that envelops the world today is what? A flimsy structure. And the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet وسلم, has given us the guidance, the blue map, the down to the masses. Not everyone may know technical terms relating to those philosophies 
but they may espouse and express those philosophies in layman's terms like the worship of material having its roots in materialism which is what believing only in material tangible uh, existence not believing in the metaphysical spiritual realm someone may say I only believe in what I see they do not realize this belief is embedded in materialism the belief that the only thing that exists is the material realm nothing exists beyond the material realm such a person will reject the spirit the ruh so if you ask them do you believe in the ruh they will say no do you believe you have a soul they will say no even if you ask them do you have an intellect they will say no it's only a chemical reaction that occurs in my mind this has its roots in materialism <coughs> likewise neoliberalism the belief that what is deemed as right and wrong is determined by society in actual fact is the worship of the nafs what is this dictating it is dictating that if the overwhelming majority of people deem something as good then that thing is good so this would mean a democratic way of thinking would mean that the majority of people are nihilistic in nature self-destructive so when the majority of people decide that something is good it means it protects the majority at the cost of the minority and this is what is termed as being democracy today that when the majority deems something as being good then it will protect what the interests of that majority what are the interests the interests are the nafs the, the ego so if the majority of society deems something as being good at the cost of the minority you have the results that we have seen in the democratic world from the time of the French Revolution through Napoleon and then carrying on to Hitler in world what they refer to as World War II which in fact was a European war and what we observe in the modern world from the destruction of Iraq and Afghanistan all the way up to today a nihilistic worldview which means what that if the majority meaning exporting democracy of course the, the terms of democracy are determined by a small minority that benefits for what is deemed as being democracy that is exported across the world but not only militarily it is exported what in terms of ideology so when they invade Afghanistan they demand a 50% women's representation in parliament even though there is no 50% representation of women in the British parliament or any parliament in the West but they demand that of Afghanistan that you must have 50% of women's representation this is the type of ideology that we today are tackling an adverse ideology an ideology a topsy-turvy world where a man if he commits adultery he is not punished by law it's not illegal but if a man carries out polygamy polygamy is what a crime by law an inverted culture what we refer to as the jal's myopic culture inverted in the sense that a man can marry a man a woman can marry a woman people can have all sorts of unnatural relationships yet if a man were to exercise his god-given right of what marrying twice it's illegal by law this is what we refer to as what the myopic the jalic culture that we observe today so humanistic philosophy entails the worship of the human whatever the majority of humans deem as being good it is good 
and it is a moral relativism. What does that mean? That nothing remains fixated. Everything is relative and subject to change. If the majority of society think or believe that you can eat other human beings, which they do anyhow through other means, that, what, that is what capitalism is. Capitalism is the unbridled growth of wealth, unbridled, without any moral restraints that only a minority of people benefit from. So today, capitalism has a monopoly on trade that only, for instance, Sainsbury's, Tesco, Asda and a few stores, they will control the entire trade that small traders would have to pay exorbitant amount of tax, would have to pay so much tax to the governments that they would not benefit in any way from their trade, but yet they refer to this as free trade. So the term is used free trade. So other human beings are cannibalized. So if the majority of people said that cannibalism is permitted, then they would deem, meaning moral relativism entails what? That it would be permitted because society allows it. So if there is a shifting tide towards permitting certain things, then that thing becomes permitted. The state of people is such that everyone has become a national insurance number. That is what you are. A national insurance number. Your name may turn up Muhammad Zaid. But on a system, you are a national insurance number. You are a taxpayer. You pay tax. We are being taxed from the time of the Norman invasion of 1066 when the doomsday book was written in that period that the British people or the English people at that time would be taxed to the Day of Judgment. This is why the book was known as the Doomsday Book. You are heavily taxed. And then, in order to live in a house, a home, you must pay mortgage rates. So now the government doubles the time for you to pay interest rates to the banks. The banks get richer, the citizens get poorer. The divide between the rich and the poor becomes wide. The rich get richer and the turn smaller in number, become a minority. The poor become a majority. They are enslaved through taxes, through what? Slave, becoming sl w slaves for their wages, wage slaves, working nine to five, having no time for anything else. And then what happens? They are giving, given two things in return. One of them <coughs> is entertainment, which includes what? The new religion, football. They are given Sky TV. They are given internet. <coughs> and the second thing they are given to make them forget their slavery is sexual freedom. And this is where the new weaponized ideology, weaponized by whom? The West. I use the term West loosely. The Anglosphere. <coughs> they weaponize something. What do they weaponize? LGBT. LGBT entails sexual freedom. When you have that sexual freedom, you become a tool in the hands of the elite. A weapon to be used against others. So when Qatar holds its <coughs> football games, LGBT <coughs> is a weapon utilized by the West against Qatar. 
and the rainbow flag becomes a weapon. So when people think they are having sexual freedom, they are only being given that sexual freedom so they do not cry about their slavery. What is the slavery? Extortionate housing. It's extortionate taxes. Inflation. The dollar itself, that we, the Muslims, utilize the dollar in our Muslim countries. But if you take the rupee to New York, you cannot even buy a can of Coke. You go to a shop, in New York, give them a hundred rupees, they won't take it. You go to Pakistan, you give them ten dollars, they will take it. But is the dollar even backed by anything? The answer is no. It's fiat money. It's only backed by law. It has no intrinsic value. Yet we deal with the dollar, but they do not deal with the rupee. So, this is a type of slavery. Yet, they give you sexual freedom. So they will have movements. Mary Jissam, Mary Marzi, whatever the movement's called. Pakistani version of LGBT. Here, young, young people become brainwashed through what the social engineering that occurs in schools social engineering that occurs on television on social media social engineering where they have the ro rainbow flag this is social engineering they so they are carrying out what social experiments brainwashing you carrying out thought reform to reform the way you think on the mobile phone on social media on television through the media Thought reform, the Chinese, they use more barbaric methods where they may have, and remember both China and America are controlled by the banking elite. Do not fall for the narrative of China versus America. Both are controlled by the bankers. The bankers are in charge of both nations. Like the bankers were in charge of Napoleon, and they were in charge of the British at Waterloo. They funded both sides. Whoever comes out as the winner, the bankers benefit. China may utilize <coughs> outdated techniques of torture. But what is referred to as the Anglosphere will utilize what? Techniques of Hollywood, which is from Hollywood. Because the wood was utilized for what? Of course, in imagination, to hypnotize people. Hollywood, Metro Goldwyn, migrants from Eastern Europe, Jewish migrants who established some of the main Hollywood film bases that we observe today. Television, movies, in order to normalize certain concepts and this is another thing the utilization of the word normalize because now they use the word normalize with israel that uae will normalize its relationship with israel as if to say to acquiesce to the invaders the jewish european invaders of palestine to acquiesce to them is to be normal and to resist them is to be abnormal therefore the utilization of the word normalize in future Saudi Arabia is going to normalize its relationship with Israel so-called Israel the occupying forces like they misuse the word collateral damage what is collateral damage when an army invades a region or air raids a region and bombs people and civilians die, this is referred to as collateral damage. It's the neater word, the cleaner word to use instead of saying civilians that were murdered. When is the IDF, Israeli Defense Force, they carry out 
barbaric acts of terrorism against a Semitic people who are the Arab Palestinians, it is not referred to as anti-Semitism, even though the Arabs are Semitic. The Arabs are Semitic. When they are killed by the IDF, it's not anti-Semitism. When they are murdered, they may say IDF killed Palestinian children. They will not say murdered. The IDF murdered Palestinian children. Very selective in their wording. This is the social engineering. The brainwashing that you come across every day on your social media, on your television, on your newspapers. Similarly, when the term normalization is utilized for normalizing LGBT, LGBT is, has now become a weapon to use against governments, but to say LGBT community as if to equate. Like when we say the Muslim community, the Christian community, the Jewish community, the Hindu community, the Sikh community, according to religion, the word religion is from religio, which means to unite people. This is the meaning of the word religion in English, to unite people. We use the word deen, the deen of Allah. Similarly, you have racial and ethnic communities. Even though in Islam, Islam transcends ethnicity. So this is why sometimes in Islam, the Khalifa will not ask your ethnicity. He will not ask your ethnicity. In fact, the majority of people would not even know their ethnicity because their DNA is lost. It's not important. But then you have this LGBT community, the word community utilized. It's like having an alcoholics community, a gambler's community. So the word community is not a word we would accept according to our right to so-called freedom of speech. Of course, freedom of speech is another weaponized statement. Freedom of speech for certain people. Freedom of speech for certain subjects. But not freedom of speech for Muslims. So when you have this term, community, what does community entail? According to Islam, the homosexual act is forbidden. It's like drinking alcohol. It's like gambling. It's not permitted. But to make a community out of this, for us, it should be like what? The alcohol alcoholic community. Soon you may have one. Or the gambler's community. So all the gamblers, they have a community. So young people should not be brainwashed into thinking that LGBT is a community in the sense that we have racial communities or religious communities. Otherwise, we should accept alcoholics community, gamblers community. So this type of social engineering that we observe every day has its roots in all these various philosophies. Humanism, which is the worship of humankind, Neo philosophies, meaning new age uh, or updated philosophies of moral relativism, that morality is relative to time and place. Morality changes with time and place. Islam does not accept this. There is morality from the final revelation, which is the re revelation of Sayyiduna Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, sent to Sayyiduna Muhammad. Sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam That um, there are certain codes of morality That will never change with time and place And this is something That Muslims when they go to the workplace They should realize That the non-Muslims The kafir What is a kafir? A kafir is someone who covers the truth When the kafir attempts to make you an alcoholic or commit zina, adultery and fornication 
or to become a homosexual. It is because in the eyes of the kafir, it's a challenge for him to make you his plaything. It's not because he cares for you. So similarly, when the kafir attempts to ideologically brainwash Muslims into thinking that certain things are normalized or certain things are acceptable within Islam, it is no different to the Chinese brainwashing that we hear regarding the Uyghur Muslims. The only difference is the approach. The approach is different. With the Uyghurs, they place them in camps. They brainwash them. Here, they make you a taxpaying citizen. They tax you to the, till there's nothing left. In fact, most of us will never reach a certain threshold of living. And similarly, you pay interest or usually to the banks for the rest of your life, you take out the mortgage, you pay to make you forget this, they give you fantasy TV and football. And then like the Roman Colosseums in the old days, people sit in a stadium, except in the old days, the, the lions would eat the gladiator. And in this day and age, we watch people kick around a leather football. That's the only difference. Yes. So what are the challenges that we are facing? These are the challenges. How do we counter them? Strengthening of Iman. The first act is what? Strengthening our Iman. Iman in what? In Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and our love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. If someone increased their love for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when a non-Muslim brings an objection to regarding Sayyiduna Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, their iman would not shake because they love Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam more than anything. La yu'minu ahadukum hatta akuna ahabba ilayhi min walidihi wa waladihi wa nasi ajma'in. None of you is a believer. Until I, meaning Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, become more beloved than his children, his parents, and all of humanity. So if you love Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam more than the kafir system, than the Dajjal system, than the Dajjal the, or Dajjalic system, then your iman should never shake. You must be confident in your iman. When you enter the workplace, you must be a confident Muslim because you have strength of Iman. This is the first step. Increasing Iman. How do we increase in Iman? Increasing our love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Secondly, by increasing our knowledge of the Quran and the Sunnah. Increasing our knowledge of what the Quran states and the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So when the deviant kafir, the kafir who wants to deviate Muslims from the right path, he brings up objections against the Quran, against the Sunnah. Do not be ignorant that you cannot even respond to him. Even with your mind. One of the sheikhs of Syria during the French occupation was traveling with a French general. And generally speaking, I say France is one of the worst countries in the world alongside with the illegal occupied state, uh, the illegal occupied Palestine, the illegal occupation which refers to itself as Israel, France and Israel. Very bad places to live. When the French, because you have to remember, after the French Revolution in 1789 and 1791, during that period, they killed their own population, France. They killed their own population. So why would they have mercy on anyone else? When they invaded Algeria, they killed the, a 
huge majority of the male population, similar to Mussolini in Libya. So when the French occupied Syria, one of the sheikhs was traveling with a French general in a train. The French general had his wife and his daughter. They presented grapes to the sheikh. The sheikh ate from the grapes. Then they presented wine. The sheikh said, I do not drink wine, it's pro prohibited in Islam. The general made a mockery and said, why is grapes permitted? Wine is just from grapes. So he made a mockery. So the sheikh responded, he said, is that your wife? He said, yes. He said, is that your daughter? He said, yes. He said, do you sleep with your daughter? He said, no. He said, why not? She is from her. Of course, this was what? Al-Jawab al-Muskit, the silencing answer. Confidence in your Iman and knowing how to respond. Do not allow anyone to make a mockery of the religion except that you give an intellectual reply. When people cannot reply from the intellect, they respond with violence. We Muslims must respond with what? Intellect not respond with violence. We are not nihilistic. So those people who crashed the airplanes into the two badly constructed towers, which are known as the twin trade towers, badly constructed, they were, they were nihilistic in nature. They were nihilistic. Of course, the same nation had thrown nuclear bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So the nation itself is nihilistic. The USA is nihilistic in its foreign policy. It, it is the only nation ever to have dropped nuclear weapons on another nation. On Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And then people, Saudi citizens, Saudi citizens, allies of America, Saudi, the Saudi royal family, which is allies of America, nihilistic thinking that drove planes into the Twin Towers. Those people, they were nihilistic in nature. As Muslims, we should know how to give al-ajwibatul muskita, the silencing response. If people cannot respond intellectually, they resort to violence. So when you see non-Muslims making caricatures, cartoons, Instead of responding violently, not that I'm pacifying anyone. Unlike some scholars for dollars, they pacify Muslims. No. I'm saying let's give a response which is more effective. What is more beloved to France than anything else? Its flag and its constitution, and its so-called republic, and its so-called French revolution, then the Muslims should make a response by making caricatures of the French flag. The Muslims should make a response by making caricatures of what? The French revolution. The French revolution was a violent revolution. This should be the most cerebral response from the Muslims. Similarly, and I say this without apology, today people are condemning America's involvement in Pakistani politics. But if yesterday the former Prime Minister had responded to France, today he would be still in power. He responded weakly, to France, and he was ousted by America. If he stood strong against France, today he would have stood strong against America. So the response of the Muslim world should be more cerebral, more effective. And similarly, 
young people like ourselves should not be brainwashed by the new tides of fashions that come about every few decades. Every few decades, there is a new tide of a fashion. That tide washes away many young people into misguidance. Stay firm on the teachings of the Quran and the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and have the cerebral intellectual response to any problem that we may face. I ask Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala to strengthen our Iman in these times of tribulation and I ask Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala that He makes us ambassadors of the religion of Al-Islam the religion of Sayyiduna Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alaihi Wa Sallam أَقُولُ قَوْلِ هَذَا وَاسْتَغْفِرُ اللَّهَ لِي وَلَكُمْ وَأَتُوبُ إِلَيْهِ Inshallah we will open up for questions and answers up until Maghrib time Inshallah. So what time is Maghrib? 9.36. So Inshallah we will open up for questions and answers. So if the hosts can come to the front, the invisible hand, please come to the front. We will open up for questions and answers, inshallah. So if you can chair the questions and answers to select the people if they have any written answers, questions as well. If any of the brothers have got any questions, if you want to write them down as well, ask them to share. Invite the ulama to the front. Get them chairs. Chairs there. Cheers. Cheers, cheers, cheers. Okay, so we'll start questions. If anyone has a written question, send them to the front. If you want to ask your questions, place your hand up. I'll select the people, then go under that at the front. Uh, the question is what I mentioned regarding practical steps was an increase of love for Allah and His Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, increase of Iman. How do we go about doing this? The answer is, I'll give you two short answers. One is remembering the favors of Allah and His Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. When you remember the favors of Allah upon you, like what? The fact that today you, you had fresh water to bathe yourself. Imagine you had no water for, a, in, in, for three days. The fact that we have drinking water is a favor of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The fact that we have vision. Imagine you awoke one day and you had no vision, waliyadu billah, or no immune system. That is what? Observing ni'amullah, the favors of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So increasing in what? Remembering the favors of Allah and his Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. What are the favors of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam upon us? The revelation of the Quran, the teachings of the Sunnah, and so many other things. Secondly, by increasing dhikrullah and salawat and salam upon Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. When we take these two practical steps, what will happen? Our Iman will increase. One person said to me, when I was in Syria, when I came back, he said to me, some of you students who go to Syria, come back radicalized. And I said, 
why do you deem us as being radicalized? He said, there was nothing actual radi well, the term radical is interpretive. But I said, when we go to Bilad al-Sham, we were accompanying people who would always be engrossed in what? Dhikrullah. What is the natural result when you are always engrossed in dhikrullah and salawat and salam upon Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam? Strengthening of iman. So you, you are misinterpreting strengthening of iman as being radicalized. Dhikrullah and salawat and salam upon Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam like reciting Quran. Because when we went there, the ulama, they would encourage re recitation of the Quran Dhikrullah, different forms of dhikrullah, salawat and salam upon Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, this would increase your iman. Staying in good company, avoiding haram, all of these things would what? Increase iman. The second question was relating to tala, uh, how do we increase knowledge? You know the longest verse of the Quran is in which chapter? In Surah Al-Baqarah. Regarding what? Trade. Ya 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 ladina amanu ida tadayantum bidainin ila ajali musamma to the end of the verse, longest verse of the Quran. What does the end of the verse say? What taqullah wa yuallimukumullah. Be God wary, be wary of Allah, and Allah will teach you. Yes? Regarding Sayyiduna Khidr alayhi salam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَعَلَّمْنَاهُمْ مِنْ لَدُنَّ عِلْمًا We taught him from our divine presence knowledge. Allah taught him. So this means the more taqwa you have, the more knowledge you should have. Your knowledge should increase. What is taqwa? Once someone said to me, taqwa is, this is wrong. He goes, Taqwa is when you're alone at home, instead of sitting down, uh, standing up and drinking water, you sit down and drink water. That's not taqwa. Taqwa is when you're alone at home, you avoid haram more than you avoid in public. Yes? When you're in private, you avoid haram more than you avoid in public. This is taqwa. So the more taqwa you have, the more you will learn. But how do you increase taqwa? Through dhikrullah. Through increasing dhikrullah, recitation of the Qur'an. Reflecting on the meanings of the Qur'an. أَفَلَا يَتَدَبَّرُونَ الْقُرْآنَ أَمْ عَلَىٰ قُلُوبٍ أَقْفَالُهَا Do they not reflect upon the Qur'an or do they have on the hearts, do they have locks of the hearts? Are the hearts sealed? The answer is, if the hearts are not sealed, you will what reflect on the meanings of the Quran. So increasing taqwa means what? Increasing zikrullah. Increasing zikrullah increases taqwa. Increasing taqwa increases ilm. There was a sheikh called a sheikh Hamidi al Arabi, rahimahullah ta'ala. He passed away at the age of 118. For 80 plus years, he prayed Fajr Salah and Salatul Tahajjud in Al Jamil Umawi, Grand Umayyad Masjid. So we would visit him regularly and he would have powerful kashf. If someone asked him regarding someone, Fulan bin Fulan, he'd close his eyes and he'd tell you, tell him this, this, and this, and he'd be correct in everything. Tell him to stop doing this, tell him to do this, tell him to do this. He'll be correct in everything. So when I was younger, I asked one of the shiuch in Syria, I thought this is a knowledge he acquired through learning. So I said, who taught Sheikh Hamdi al-Arabi to do this? The Sheikh looked at me in puzzlement and said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taught him, meaning it's what ilm la dunni. But how did he attain ilm ladunni? Through taqwa, through sharia, through dhikrullah. And this is what we are lacking now in this age when we are living in Dajjalic times that if someone has weakness of iman, 
a small uh, an ideology which is weak at its foundations it's like the spider's web this is why the talk the next talk is termed the spider's web Baytul Ankabut the spider's web we are exposed to an ideology our iman becomes weak why is it weak because we are not engrossed in dhikrullah we are not engrossed in taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we are not engrossed in talabul ilm seeking knowledge of the Quran and sunnah then when we are exposed to the world our foundations are weak homophobia or persecution of a person that is not what we are stating you do not persecute people as i said to you we have intellectual responses so this mayor where are the article writers from our community can write an intellectual article refuting him yes an intellectual article that refutes him and then is spread on social media amongst all Muslims and non-Muslims the intellectual response you understand as opposed to egging someone like the mayor's walking someone eggs him that's not a response a response is writing an articulate intellectual response you know the importance of eloquence and articulation is such that when people cannot express themselves they resort to violence or swearing or shouting this happens sometimes some youngsters they want to express their feelings they are unable to do so so they play rap music yes or they sing terribly why is that because they have fallen into the 1984 Orwellian trap of where if you remember in 1984 the book what does the government do the totalitarian government they reduce the dictionary why do they reduce the dictionary because the less words you have in your vocabulary the less you are able to express and articulate yourself the less you are able to articulate yourself you resort to stupidity and violence is that clear so raise the standard and respond intellectually where is the intellectual who can write a response to this Lord Mayor the Lord Mayor is probably unable to even read the article that will be written demonstrate his stupidity demonstrate the fact that he is an imbecile any additional questions inshallah So what happens in today's school learning is that children that are inquisitive or have an inquisitive mind they are gagged by the school so young children should be trained in the right to exercise their freedom of speech so they should go to school with a new label saying I have the right to exercise my freedom of speech in fact you should make t-shirts I have the right to exercise my freedom of speech this t-shirt should be made everyone should wear the t-shirt to school and when you exercise your right to freedom of speech ask the teacher who only reads the script that he is given what are the harmful effects what are the STDs associated with the homosexual act please inform us and educate us regarding the STDs and the harms some of the harms which I will not express in the masjid hall because they are so gross in their detail that I am too bashful to express in the masjid so the young person should wear I have the right to to freedom of speech and to self-expression and what is the freedom of speech and self-expression the right to question what are the STDs associated educators regarding STDs 
because with the heterosexual act, they, they teach you the STDs associated with the heterosexual sex. But please inform us of the harmful effects of the homosexual act. What are the STDs? This is one way of countering this. So as I said, cerebral responses to the system. How do we take on the power systems? We talk to power and we exercise our freedom to, of speech. Is that clear? Again, are we permitted to teach our counter-narrative in the Madaris? The answer is yes. We have every right in the mosque to teach our counter-narrative like what I am doing now. We have every right to do this. So the question is, someone insults Rasulullah and man sabba nabiyan faqtuluhu, whoever insults a prophet, kill him. Firstly, the command to kill is to, for whom? The hukam, the hakim, the qadi. The difference is that if a common person takes the law into his own hand, he does khilaf awla, Khilaf awla. But he is not punished by death or capital punishment by the government, Islamic government. So in an Islamic country or the Khilafah, if someone kills a person who insulted a prophet, the Khalifa does not punish that person with death. He can be imprisoned for life, potentially, or even released, depending on the case. But the command is for whom? The Hakim, the Qadi, to give that judgment. So what's the obligation on the layman? If the layman carries out that act, he carries out an act of had, hudud, and then the, he is at the discretion of the government. He is at the discretion of the government. So in this country, or any majority of the world, if you take the law into your own hand, you endanger yourself by being at the discretion of that government. So therefore, the person who insults out of ignorance, we respond to him the way Sayyiduna Salman al-Farsi radiallahu an responded. When the mushrik of Quraysh said to Sayyiduna Salman radiallahu an, with the intention to insult, he said, your prophet even teaches you how to relieve yourself with the intention to insult, Sayyiduna Salman al-Farsi turned the tables. He said, yes, he does. He teaches us to wipe three times and to wash ourselves. Teaching the mushrik the wisdom of Istinja and turning the argument against him. In our current situation, everyone in this hall cannot go and kill a kafir, practically speaking. Therefore, they need to learn how to respond cerebrally and intellectually and effectively and also what giving ballighu anni wa law ayah relaying the Quran and the Sunnah to the non-Muslims effectively because they are also brainwashed by the mass social programming that we observe the non-Muslim like Hindus in India they are being programmed by the BJP. BJP has programmed so many Hindus. Similarly, the right, what people refer to as the political right, or whatever narrative, they have socially engineered a mass of people. So it's entirely upon us to counter that social programming. Any other questions? Please place your hands up. So the question is regarding perennialism, the perennial philosophy is perennial, linguistically I think it means universal. It entails, the philosophy entails that all religions lead to guidance. 
Why is this faulty internally? Because it leads to multiple contradictions. How can we say Paul's Christianity, because remember, Christianity is the invention of Paul. How can we say Paul's Christianity, which is man worship, which entails drinking the blood of Christ, and eating his flesh, which is the Eucharist. In early Christology, when they would eat that small piece of bread, in Catholicism, they deemed it literally to turn into the flesh of Christ. So it's cannibalism. And then drinking the, bl the, the blood of Christ, the wine represents blood. This is cannibalism. How can man worship and cannibalism be truthful and lead to salvation. Similarly, God needing an ultimate sacrifice that he sacrifices his own divine attribute, which they refer to as his son. How can this belief be compatibilized with Tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Similarly with Judaism, Judaism today, what is referred to as Judaism, is the invention of the tribe of Judah in the 7th century BC, one tribe from the 12 tribes, one tribe. They tampered the teaching of Musa alayhi salam, and then hundreds of years later, in the 7th century, in the Christian era, 7th century, a Turkic tribe known as the Ashkenazi Jews resided in Central Asia, or the region between the Middle East, or the Near East and Russia, they adopted this Judaism and now they refer to themselves as Semitic, like Benjamin, Benjamin Netanyahu. He's not Semitic. He's Turkic Ashkenazi. And what they have adopted, Judaism, is in fact rabbinical teachings of the rabbis. It's not the teaching of Musa alayhi salam. How can that lead to salvation? Similarly, Hinduism, a term given by the British to an uh, amalgamation of pagan uh, sects that were the, across uh, the diaspora, across India, various pagan sects that worshipped the seasons and nature. This was termed as being Hinduism. How can this lead ultimate to ultimate guidance? Similarly, Sikhism, which is what? a political attempt to compatibilize between Islam and Hinduism, a failed attempt by a false prophet. Similarly, Buddhism, which is the worship of material, a materialistic philosophy, all of these are false teachings. The only religion which has been preserved is the Quran and the Sunnah, which is Al-Islam which is submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So as I said, feminism is the worship of the female. Humanism is the worship of the human being. And, uh, relativism is the worship of what? Of the human ego. Capitalism is the worship of profiteering, unbridled profiteering. Islam is the submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And perennial philosophy is a man-made Philosophy which is false, which some people attempt to push amongst Muslims and attempt to make mainstream amongst Muslims. So that is, in short, the refutation of what? The perennial philosophy. So in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions Millata Ibrahim. Millata Ibrahim is the way of Ibrahim, Sayyiduna Ibrahim alayhi salam, kana Hanifa. That Hanifa means the one who turned away from polytheism. So the Christian can never be following Millata Ibrahim. The Jew can never be following Millata Ibrahim. The Quran affirms who is upon Millat Ibrahim, Sayyiduna Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So this term Abrahamic faith is pushed by organs of the United Nations. 
and various organs within the United Nations are now pushing for Abrahamic faiths. Why? To make one world religion with the capital as Jerusalem. So do not be shocked if in the near future you see that the UN relocates from New York the land which was donated by the Rockefeller Foundation, that is upon which the UN building was constructed, if it relocates from New York to Jerusalem. Why to make Jerusalem the capital of the one world religion? This attempt can happen at any time. And there are people like Bin Bayya who push for so-called normalization with Israel or the illegal occupation and at the same time, they, they, his second fiddle, Bin Bayer's second fiddle, pushes for a perennial world religion. A perennial world religion. Do not be shocked if we observe these things in the near future. Atanabbuh fi husni tashabbuh. And the book is written. Uh, the author, he was from Gaza al Ghazi. The book is published by Darun Nawadir. <laughs> See, so called Salafism is a, is a form of nihilism which tells us to discard the four madhahib, the four Sunni schools, in the name of Salafism, to return back to the Salaf. But this is a contradiction, because the four madhahibs were formulated in the time of the Salaf. So if you want to be a real Salafi, you go back to the four schools. So it's a claim that they go back to the Quran and Sunnah, yet it contradicts the very claim itself, it's an internal contradiction because when they go back to a Salaf, they attempt to dismantle the four schools and then give their own interpretation to the Quran and Sunnah, which leads to the modern so-called Islam. It leads to that. So the likes of Muhammad Abdu, Afghani, Rashid Rida, all these misguided individuals, they coined the term Salafism because it was a rejection of the four madhabs and going back to what? Reinterpreting the Quran and Sunnah. So they may start as hardline Salafis, they end up being uh, what we refer, re refer to as reformists. They attempt to reform the entire religion. So Salafism is an internal contradiction. Now how do we take those youngsters away from pseudo-Salafism by us Sunnis adopting the teachings of the Quran and Sunnah in terms of quotation. We should be utilizing the books of Hadith. So a Sayyid Muhammad bin Alawi al-Maliki rahimahullah ta'ala attempted to make a movement in Makkah al-Mukarramah where Sunnis are quoting the Ahadith. And when they would quote the hadith of Ahkam, they would say, this hadith, like for instance, the hadith, إِذَا بَلَغَ الْمَاءُ قُلَّتَيْنِ لَمْ يَحْمِلِ الْخَبَثِ If water reaches the amount of قُلَّتَيْن, it doesn't carry impurity. If you quote this hadith, you mention what the Shafi'i say, you mention what the Hanafi say, you mention what the Maliki say, you mention the interpretation of one hadith to the audience. So their mind opens to understanding the ikhtilaf. But the mistake so many pseudo-Sunnis did over the years is that they thought that if you quote Bukhari and Muslim and Tirmidhi, you are a, that is the methodology of the Salafis. That's false. The Sunnis need to go back to quoting Quran and Sunnah in abundance. Then you will never have youngsters going towards Salafism. So a Sayyid Alawi, the father of Sayyid Muhammad bin Alawi, he wrote a commentary to Bulugh al-Maram, the book by Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani, which is a book 
on the ahadith al ahkam the ahadith of the rulings so sunni youth must go back to these books quote works like riyadhus salihin mishkatul masabih read books of hadith hadith will never misguide you hadith will guide you so once we have this attitude we adopt or not adopt reclaim reading hadith then this claim of the Salafis will fall apart because they do not represent a Salafus Salihun. In fact, they follow modern figures like Albani, Nasiruddin al Albani, all his life he waged war against the Hanafi school. Then he wrote a book called Sifatu Salatin Nabi, saying the book has proofs for the prayer. And in that book, he condemned the Hanafis and others, saying they write fiqh books with no proof. Then later on, he himself wrote a summarized version of his own book in which he took out the proofs. So, in effect, he made people do taqlid of himself. So when the ISIS, the so-called ISIS, when they were leading pray uh, prayer in the Masjid of Nuruddin Shaheed, the Zangi, rahimullah, they were praying according to the madhab of Nasiruddin al-Albani, who created the fifth madhab. So Salafism is defunct. Now with bin Salman, Salafism is even more defunct. But how do we reclaim our essence? We reclaim it by going back to citations of Quran and Sunnah. What's your opinion on the new um, Hajj last week? What about the new Hajj? Uh, that last week you said, well, how you doing Hajj? What's your opinion on that? So, uh, who I mentioned, bin Salman. Bin Salman has hired Hindu and Jewish companies to organize the Hajj for him. So capitalism is in charge of Arabia in the form of the Saudi royal family. To the point that the Saudi royal family even has advertisement on its umbrellas. So they may have a company, yeah, yeah, ad DHL. Advertising on the umbrellas. So now you have corporations sponsoring the Hajj. They did this before when they had corporations like Hilton Hotel in Al Madina Al Munawwara. So it's a capitalist. It's a capitalist what economy and a capitalist uh, hold of the Haramain. Currently, what we observe. So when will it change when the Muslims overthrow this system? The Muslims need to overthrow the system, the current uh, occupation, uh, the capitalist occupation of the Haramain. This, this is what we are observing. So it's a fitna, a tribulation. But is this not a flaw? Uh, just, I, just, I just said that because it's actually... No, no, apparently, but it's not. Because uh, you're not still out your money. And you yeah. don't know. So again, Ghazi Alamuddin, he killed a man who insulted the Prophet ﷺ like if someone kills Salman Rushdie. He, has not, he is liable to be punished by the country that is occupying. The problem is India is Darul Islam, occupied by an occupying force. That's a Muslim country. It belonged to the Mughals, Mughal dynasty. The Mughal dynasty had righteous rulers like whom? Like whom? Aurangzeb, rahimullah, who had a dastur constitution which is Islamic, Fatawa Alamgiri. So Alamuddin Shaheed, what he did was permitted. But if someone does this in a place which is governed by someone else, they place themselves under the law of that land. So in the Allah, he may be shaheed, in the Allah. But in terms of fiqh, he should not take the law into his own hand. It's khilaf awla. But if he does, then he endangers himself to the governments. So I'm saying that practically speaking, what should our response be? Intellectual, in the current climate.
again, as I mentioned, there is a distinction between a mufti and a qadi. And a qadi's fatwa, a qadi doesn't give a fatwa. A qadi carries out the law. So you need a khalifa and an Islamic caliphate, which is a fard kifaya to reestablish upon the Muslims. They, it's a fard kifaya on the Muslims today to reestablish a khilaf. How can they do that? Even if they make a trading block between Morocco and Indonesia and Malaysia, a trading Muslim block that only deals with the, with the silver dirham. Why is silver? Because silver is cheaper. Imagine if the Muslims today had the willingness and the fortitude to establish a trading block between Morocco and Indonesia and Malaysia where Muslim traders could freely pass through the borders with that visa, trading only in silver, how much the Muslim world would be strengthened. In that context, if they establish one Amir who is a Khalifa and he has Qudrat, Qadis who carry out the punishment, they don't just write fatwas. Today, the part of the fitna is that everyone becomes a mufti. But in reality, they are muft. Yes, a qadi is under a khalifa and then he carries out the punishment also. So many of these things that we witness today are a fitna because we have the absence of a khalifa. We don't have someone like a Sultan Abdul Hamid al-Thani rahimullah who carried out the effectuation of certain verdicts. Again, personally, I don't think there will be any major event to transpire because the 100-year treaty entailed that ships carrying cargo and passengers through the Bosphorus and through Turkey remain untaxed until the year 2023. So once that treaty is finished, will Turkey ratify the treaty or will they uh, become independent in terms of taxing passengers and making profit from that? But from what I hear, the treaty also has the freedom of Turkey to re-establish the caliphate. If that is the case, it entails how weak Turkey is. Remember, Ataturk, and some people in Pakistan, they praise Ataturk, ignorantly. No one mentions the fact that Ataturk initially utilized Islam to utilize the Muslim masses to fight the Europeans. Later on, he turned against the Muslims. And then he killed hundreds and thousands of Muslims within Turkey. What did he leave Turkey with? Is this Salah time? Yes. So your question remains unanswered. Inshallah, we will tackle that some other time.